Polly, dear. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Joan. Have a nice weekend. <laughs> machines in the office, the computer is probably the most awe-inspiring. But despite all the hype and jargon surrounding them, they've now become so easy to use that they're on almost every office desk. This change would never have happened without word processing. For most people, word processing is actually their only use for a computer. It is an extraordinarily elaborate way to write something with a separate keyboard, monitor, computer and printer, but uh, the ease of trying sentences out and moving them about does give writing a whole new freedom. In this program, Rex and I are going to look at the evolution of the word processor and at least try to demystify some of the jargon surrounding it. The word processor came from combining the computer with a much earlier invention, the typewriter. This is part of the Science Museum's enormous collection of typewriters. The first attempts were unbelievably clumsy. This is the appropriately named Pratt Terratype of 1860. The paper goes on here, that's the maximum size on this plate. And when you press one of the piano keys, the type pops up here. It's unbelievably tiny. This is uh, an early typewriter made by Charles Wheatstone. This one looks a bit like an old primer stove. It actually still works quite well. Now this one, you put the paper in this uh, brass frame with a bit of carbon over it. And then you put the writing ball down on top of it punch in the letters, or well, they're supposed to spring back out again. Press the keys while the, while the um, frame moves under it. And uh, this one's a sort of early version of a golf ball. But uh, this machine, um, the Scholes and Glidden from 1875, revolutionised the typewriter. This was the first one that could type faster than you could write by hand. It was the first machine to be mass-produced and the first machine to have the QWERTY layout of the keys that's been used ever since. His machine appeared just at the time that offices were expanding rapidly. By 1900, typewriters had become an established part of any office, introducing a whole new workforce of women. Miss Smith, what can you tell us about your Model B? Right now, I wouldn't trade my typewriter for the world. The new improvements to typewriter ribbons and the new proportional spacing of my Model B, our business letters appear so elegant. And I've even increased my typing speed, too. One thing, though. I wish they'd invent a typewriter that could erase or eliminate errors. I'd never have to stop to erase again. Well, maybe someday. Word processors remove this problem because before everything's finally committed to paper, it's stored in a form that's easy to modify and manipulate in electrical circuits. If you're opening a machine up, it gives no obvious clue how it does this. It just reveals a maze of intricate circuits and a collection of inscrutable silicon chips. Tiny even more complicated mazes of minute circuits. It's sort of worlds within worlds. However, all these tiny circuits are really just vast collections of transistors, just like this. And all each transistor does, i just put it in this holder here, is to switch the electric current on and off. 
In theory, an entire computer could be made from enough transistor circuits like this. This computer board's all still connected up, and if I pause it for a minute, at any instant, every single transistor in the chip is either fully on or fully off. Everything that's fed into the computer has to be converted to a form that can be handled by the on-off language of the chips. Word processing uses a code called ASCII. The letters of the alphabet are converted to seven bits that can each be on or off. So if I type a letter A, that's on, off, 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 on, on. B is a different one. C, D, E. Each letter of the alphabet likes a different combination and capital letters turn this bit off. The idea of coding things in a digital way like this started long before the age of computers. Have your tickets ready. All tickets, please. Well, howdy, ma'am. May I see your ticket? Uh, sure. <laughs> These tickets, called punch photographs, had lists which were punched out when the ticket was bought. All seems to match in here. Each space on the ticket could be punched or not punched, a primitive digital code. I like what I see. Oh. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> Why, thank you. Hey, you suspicious-looking character. Give me your ticket. Sure. What? The punch photograph was a futile attempt to deter train robbers. This don't match up. We have a robber on the train. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, everyone, don't panic. Don't panic. Just, just, just get out of here. <laughs> this is my lucky day. An inventor called Herman Hollerith adapted the cards to record numbers and letters of the alphabet for the US census count of 1890. Hollerith's machines became widely adopted in offices. The holes in the card form digital codes similar to the ASCII codes in a computer. However, Hollerith machines could only sort and count things. The unique advantage of a computer is that it can perform an infinite variety of processes. Instead of the fixed mechanisms in the Hollerith machines, computer circuits can be given infinitely variable coded instructions, the computer program. Computer programs are also written in codes of on-off bits. While the computer's working, both the program and the data, the letters you type, are stored inside chips called the computer's RAM, or random access memory. A chip like this can store 64,000 bits. But every time you switch the computer off, all the bits inside here are lost. So uh, to save things more permanently, they're recorded on magnetic disks. The coating of these disks is just the same as uh, audio or videotape. And the codes are recorded as minute bits of magnetism. With a solution of iron powder, you can actually see the magnetised parts of the disk. Each of these tracks can actually hold 72,000 on-off bits. Hard disks are the same idea, but they can store literally thousands of millions of bits. They're so sensitive they have to be sealed up inside the computer. And these heads, which record and play back the information, are so close to the disk that they do occasionally collide with it. And that's the origin of the computer crash. Terry's gerbil has got to go. If I could only find that memo about... Although the contents of the RAM and the disks are referred to as the computer's memory, it should really be called storage. Maybe Brenda remembers.